Once she's in the booby hatch, throw the key away. That'll put you in the driver's seat. You'd make a wild driver, Harry. With 50 million bucks. What she saw was beyond belief until others, too, faced its hideous, uncontrollable menace. Attack of the 50-foot woman, incredibly huge, with incredible desires for love and vengeance. You know, they just don't make movie trailers like they used to. That movie, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, came out decades ago, but now I want to watch it because of that trailer. Another reason to watch that film is the lovely Yvette Vickers. Yvette Vickers was a fixture in films and on television from the mid-50s into the mid-70s, and along the way became a cult movie icon. Sadly, the tragic circumstances of her death, Yvette passed away in her home sometime in 2010, and her body wasn't discovered for nearly a year. Those sad circumstances have, in the public's mind, obscured the fine work she did as an actress and the wonderful person she was. And now, her life is about to be celebrated. Author and historian John O'Dowd, best known for his book Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, The Barbara Payton Story, was a personal friend of Yvette Vickers and will soon be releasing an audiobook called My Friend, Yvette Vickers, in her own words. John, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Ghosty. Well, it's my pleasure. You know, I referred to this as an audiobook, but to me, this is really more of an audio documentary because we hear Yvette's voice. You know, she really comes alive on this project. When did you first become aware of Yvette Vickers? Was it uh, via a a film or a television show? Yes, I was no more than uh, seven or eight years old, and there used to be a TV show on here in the New York City area called Chiller Theater. Right. And um, I used to watch it all the time because um, I loved horror films. And one week they showed Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, which is a horror film, a sci-fi film, rather, that Yvette made in 1958. And I immediately fell in love with the picture. And I immediately fell in love with Yvette as well. I'll never forget it. I mean, I I just remember being spellbound by her appearance. She was uh, so sexy, and and she was a a bad girl in the film. And uh, it's gotten a a cult following over the years. it wasn't what you would call a grade A picture by any means, right. but uh, it has a healthy following. And um, she she sort of made an indelible impression on me at that young age. Well, even as as a B picture, when you've got Yvette Vickers and Allison Hayes in your movie, you really can't go wrong. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Yep. They, they were sure beautiful and talented as well. They were oh, good yeah. actresses. You know, it's funny, I'll just tell you my story. For me, it was the giant leeches, sometimes called Attack of the Giant Leeches. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I mean, talk about a bad girl, boy. Oh, yeah. (laughs) In that film... She paid for it, too. (laughs) Oh, sure, yeah, she got her comeuppance in that movie. But what I love about that film, and I I love Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, too, but what I love about the giant leeches, I love the idea that it's, it's essentially a monster movie, but Yvette's scenes with her husband are like something out of a Tennessee Williams play. Absolutely. Wow. That's, that's wild that you say that, because mm. Yvette, Yvette herself noticed that. And in fact, in one of the interviews she gave um, another writer, I, I can't think of who it is, uh, she did mention that, that people told her that uh, those scenes uh, in the swamp with her, her lover and her... Um, her husband, were like something out of uh, Tennessee Williams or Ilya Kazan, something out of those films. It is, yeah. In the backwoods of the Everglades, the boys had only the storekeeper's woman to talk about. You want something, Cal? I sure do, honey. Dr. 
looking at me like that. I'll look at you any way I want. You're my wife. I know how to take care of a woman like you, dude. Then, out of the swamp's depths, again appears horrifying, mysterious creatures thirsting for lover's blood. And then with that poor sap she married and she wants nothing to do with them. I mean, there's traces of baby doll in that, uh, yeah, that's in right. that film. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it, it was kind of sad, though, that her character took so long to die. Yeah, boy, she really was put through the ringer there, just laying in the swamp for <laughs> the duration for of the time. picture. Yeah. Yeah, while the leeches drain the blood from her slowly. And, of course, the camera kept cutting back to her, and she was moaning and groaning. And But she said she had a lot of fun with that film. She wasn't ashamed of either film. She loved doing them. So how do we go? How does John O'Dowd go from being a fan of Yvette Vickers to becoming a friend of Yvette's? That's a good question. Well, uh, in the late 1990s, I had recently lost my job uh, at a publishing company, and I decided to start a writing career because I've always been interested in writing. And I was interested in documenting the lives of veteran actors and recording artists. That's where my interests lie. Mm -hmm. And um, a man named Je Jerry Mezzaro on the West Coast uh, was a fan of one of my first articles, magazine articles in Film Facts magazine. And he and I started corresponding with each other, and it turned out that he was a friend of Yvette's. So when I told him of my interest in Yvette and her career, he managed to put the two of us together. He hooked us up, and we became um, regular telephone buddies. And um, it was a dream come true for me. You know, it was, it was surreal. And did it start out just as a friendship, or did it begin with the intention of maybe getting her story down to write a book with her? Well, it did begin, it started as a friendship, and because I knew that she had already uh, given many interviews to other writers. And uh, around that time, you know, interviews that she had done were in books and magazines. But she said that she had a lot of um, other things that she wanted to discuss that she hadn't had a chance to discuss with other writers. And she was wondering if we could take... Um, sort of a, a different look at her life and career from a different angle. So uh, she began recording interview tapes for me because she was living on the West Coast and I'm in New Jersey. And that just seemed the easiest way to do the interview. So from these interview tapes, I uh, fashioned an article and uh, sent it to Film Facts magazine, and they published it as a two-part article. And she was thrilled with the way it came out, as was I. I mean, it, I, it was just a dream come true for me. And what we hear in this, this audiobook are those tapes, those original tapes that she sent to you. That's right. I kept them for all these years. Paul Newman and I started kidding around on the set. We were playing lovers in the movie, and I think it kind of... Uh, almost like an improvisational exercise, you know. We, he was chasing me around this set and <laughs> all over me. <laughs> and people were shooting it. There was a Life magazine photographer there shooting the whole thing. And uh, I guess it looked a little outrageous to uh, Joanne Woodward and um, some of the people uh, that were behind the, you know, Marty Ritt and people that were friends of hers and they felt that there really was a danger there of something happening between us Paul and me James Wong Howe told me later at a screening at uh, Paramount that uh, they had intentionally cut me out they were just uh, they felt the chemistry was too hot that's a switch isn't it so uh, the tapes meant a lot to me and I kept them even after the articles were published. And then we, we started to discuss the possibility of working together on her memoirs. Um, and we talked about that for a few years back and forth. But at the time, I was working on my first book, a biography of the late actress Barbara Payton. Right. And I was kind of putting all my energy into that project. So, uh, 
even Yvette thought that it would be a better idea if I finished that project first before uh, we got into working on her memoirs. Unfortunately, though, um, that never happened. Uh, we weren't able to, to get that project off the ground. I have two observations having listened to the tape. Actually, three observations. The first is, okay. e- even though um, it's not an interview per se, that really doesn't need anybody. You know, she's uh, going off <laughs> right. the top of her head, and she seems, and I'm sure she has notes that she's telling you, but she's very lucid and detailed yes. with uh, what she says. And also, and now a considerable amount of time had passed between these movies we were just talking about from uh, the late 50s into when right. she was recording these tapes. She was a much That's older right. woman, but yes. she has this vivacious, almost girlish quality. Absolutely. Yeah. She was always that way. Uh, the Yvette I knew was bubbly and warm, uh, very kind, intelligent, extremely intelligent. Um, she kept up with the news. She watched uh, cable news shows uh, daily, regularly, all day long. Um, she had a great sense of humor. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about her. I, I have no bad memories of, of Yvette at all. She was so effervescent and uh, very young. She was in her 70s when I knew her. But you would never know it. Oh, you would never know it listening to the tape. And, and you also say in this in this book that she was uh, following Guns N' Roses. And uh, she, <laughs> yes. she was into things that uh, a 70-year-old would not be into, a normal one anyway. But, uh, you know, she well, was one extraordinary. Time, one, right. One time I called her, and there was loud music playing in the background. I said, Yvette, you're listening to Sweet Child of Mine. She said, yeah. She said, I love it. I said, so do I. <laughs> so then she said, we started talking about different, you know, rock bands that we like. And uh, she was also into uh, the song Smooth by Santana. Right. And she said to me, darling, if we ever hook up at one of those autograph shows, she says, I'm going to try to find someone to play that song so you and I can dance to it together. Oh, isn't that something? I wish it had happened. Yeah. I would have. That would have made my life. I also noticed that in in one of the sections she's talking about the difference between beatnik and the beat generation and as she's speaking I guess she has mood music on faintly in the background right. and it's very atmospheric I would say listening to this at least the first half of this is like you're sitting with Yvette Vickers in some cool beatnik apartment as she tells you oh, wow. her her life story and you know you're just having a a great great time and it might be hard for you or for anyone listening to this to not think of yvette vickers famous beatnik inspired playboy photos but but in any case <laughs> when i did the layout for playboy i i know they use that word beatnik a lot i never used it i um the Beat Generation, which Jack Kerouac talked about, was something that that we all, I, I think, took a little more seriously, and we didn't use that term. Uh, if we ever used the, the word, it would be beat, and that would be just to indicate that you liked a certain kind of poetry, a certain kind of literature, a certain kind of music. And those coffee houses that I went to, like the Unicorn and Paulette's and um, Cosmo Alley and Shelley's Manhole, all of those clubs that I went to uh, were clubs where most of these people hung out where, that were in a culture. They were uh, very serious people. I mean, I, I don't know how else to tell you that, but uh, they were very... Uh, good places they were, there was no booze there was you know most of us were on this health kick and eating vegetarian and the whole nine yards so it was a pretty wholesome thing i guess that's what i'm trying to say and uh, we talked a lot <laughs> now the other part of this is you yes. also have a series of uh, answering machine messages not only did you that's... keep the tapes but you yes. also kept the answering machine messages Right. Um, 
at one point in our friendship, uh, she said that, you know, she enjoyed speaking with me. And there were times during the day when I was working that um, she had things that she would like to share with me. And she asked me if it would be all right if she left me detailed phone messages on my answering machine. And of course, I said yes. So uh, that's what she did. <laughs> she did it quite frequently. Some of the messages went on for uh, 10, 15, even 20 minutes. Back then, I had an answering machine that had no time limit on, right. the, um, on the messages that one could leave. And um, they were just wonderful. What can I say? I mean, I don't know if you've heard any of them, but oh yeah, they, they show so much of who she was. Um, the love and support that she extended to me, how kind and, and good-hearted she was, and, and they also show the things that she was contending with uh, yeah. in, the, in the last years of her life. Because she was living alone, she was no longer married, and, um, you know, she was in her 70s, and, and life became increasingly difficult for her. Monday, 8.22 p.m. Hi, John. It's Yvette Dekers. I guess you figured out by now the fax is down. Uh, cartridge ran out. It uh, needs to be replaced, and I haven't uh, got a new one yet. And I have to go out of town. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just letting you know. I've got some answers. However, I know that uh, I have to watch out for pollution and and um, the bronchitis thing because it really can put me on the ground, just lay me down. I can't, I can't function when I'm having a bad uh, cough. As far as I know, this phone's okay. The one in L.A., the phone company said it's my job. I have to reprogram it or do whatever. You know, I've done something wrong. So, but this one should be working. So call me when you can, darling. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. And uh, call me when you can. Well, you mentioned this in this audio documentary about Yvette Vickers, that there were periods where she had issues with her computer and her phone. And yeah. I bet you people listening to this right now, uh, my audience, they know all about that because I hear about that all the time. And right. And I don't know if it was a case of people trying to get a hold of her and, and just getting frustrated and, and stopping, or she sort of closed off to the world or, but you know, the tragic circumstances of not necessarily her passing, but the discovery of her passing has cast yeah. kind of a, a ghoulish shadow over her story. I know. And, you know, that did a number on me for a long time. Yeah. Uh, the circumstances of her passing um, just haunted me and uh, uh, destroyed me. I, I just couldn't believe that someone so vibrant and vital and giving and loving could, could die such a lonely death. It, it, it's not fair. It, she didn't yeah. deserve that. And it took me a long time to be able to deal with it. I mean, when I when I think about it now, if I think about it for too long, it it really depresses me terribly. Uh, because she she had so much love to give, and um, I you know I know she had a lot of problems with technology because right. she and I shared that trait. Uh, I'm not. I'm what you call a technophobe, okay? Right. I'll yep. admit it. <laughs> so am I. I am, too. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, same thing. And uh, Yvette was, and, you know, something was always breaking on her, and so we shared that. You know, we would laugh about it. But I know I, I, I did try to reach her several times, and I, I knew she had two homes. So she would tell me that if she wasn't at her home in Beverly Hills, to always try her at her other home in Pinion Hills, uh, which was it, which is in the high desert. That's right. how she described it. So I would try, and, you know, a lot of times I just, I, sometimes I would, I would get a hold of her, and a lot of times I didn't. 
And I'm not a, I'm not a phone person. I mean, I freely admit that. So after a while, I very mistakenly um, stopped calling her. And, you know, I really, really regret that now. Well, I really yeah, regret it. here's the thing. I mean, there is something to be learned from this. People yeah. get wrapped up in things and and very legitimate things. And sometimes you think to yourself, oh, well, I'll, I'll speak to them next week. That's right. You know, at next month, I'll, well, I'll have a free time and I'll, I'll get a hold. But you know what, folks? Sometimes next week and next month doesn't come. You are so right. So you are so right. That's what you have to do. But I'll tell you what. Here's the good news. You finished her memoir because mm. it's available right now. Thank well, actually, it will you. be. It will be available in uh, November, mm. right? Yes, that's right, on Amazon. Thank you for, for saying that to me. I really appreciate it. Well, it's true. I mean, this is four-plus four, four plus hours yeah. of Yvette Vickers. And, you know, it's funny. We were, we were talking about uh, the giant leeches and Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. It, they're sort of mentioned briefly in this, and I guess we should tell people up front, you do it in the in the book as well, that um, she's really talking about other things in her career. It was her intention to talk about those two films in particular at a, at a later time. That's right, yes. Um, she felt that she had already covered those films a lot in the past with other writers. So she said to me, you know, would it be okay if we took, you know, the story from a different angle? And I said, sure. And she said, don't worry, we'll get to talking about those films later on. She said, but, you know, I really need and want to talk about my love of music and how it, how it has informed my life. And so that's what we did. Uh, you'll notice that there, you know, she discusses a lot of um, musicians whose, whose work impressed her. And her parents were musicians, and uh, she she just has a lot of great stories in that area to uh, to share. Well, again, the the book or the audio book, I guess you should say, because it really is her own words, and you can hear these recordings. Um, it's my friend Yvette Vickers in her own words by our guest today, John O'Dowd, and I guess it will be available. At Amazon, right, would be the, the easiest place to get it? Or where would people yeah, get that, it? Right, that's the easiest place to get it, and that will be in November. Right now, it's also available at my publisher's website, which is Bear Manor Media. That's B-E-A-R-M-A-N-O-R-M-E-D-I-A uh, dot com slash S-E-L-Z, cells. So that's where people could order it uh, directly from my publisher at, at, at his website. All right. Well, you got your marching orders, folks. You know what to do. Uh, John, thank you so much for coming on and sharing not only your memories of Yvette Vickers, but these recordings. And uh, congrats on finally finishing that memoir. I appreciate it very much, and I, I'm a big fan of your work. I suppose after all my hard luck stories, you must be thinking. <laughs> However, I, I don't look at it that way. I really did enjoy life the whole time. There was no time even when I couldn't get work or when there were people who seemed to be reacting harshly or negatively. I went on uh, positive. I always enjoyed life no matter what.